Blog Talk Radio. Stevie B's Media Production is a part of the Shellcaster Network. The proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ by members of the Churches of Christ. With your host, Stevie R. Butler, you're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Good evening. We have you all in the world listening to this radio broadcast. Stevie B's Media Production presents the Gospel Light Radio Show. I'm your host this evening, Stevie R. Butler. And this radio show is being broadcast from Stevie B Media Production at the Carolina studio in the great state of North Carolina with my co-host, Glenn McMillian from the state of Texas, Dr. Frank Washington Jr. from the state of Florida, Stanley Hubbard from the state of Indiana, Clay Phillips from the state of Georgia, Steve Cordell from the state of Illinois, Johnny Morris from the state of Georgia, Yusuf Ford from the state of Indiana, Brian Christian Coleman from the state of New Jersey. Ladies and gentlemen, we are just grateful for the privilege to bring you a program where we as Christians and members of the Churches of Christ can share our faith and preach and teach the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ on a weekly basis. If you'd like to contact us while we're on the air this evening, just give us a call to the live show at 713 955 Zero five zero eight, or you can go to the Blog Talk Radio website and listen to the show live there. There are over seventeen hundred live shows on that uh, website at this hour, and you will consistently find this radio show on pages one through four of that website. You'll find it on page one of the website tonight. Really do appreciate Blog Talk Radio for that. And if you have any questions or comments or any of my co-hosts uh, on this broadcast, you can send your emails to my new email address, butlersteve1009 at yahoo.com, or you can call Stevie B Media Production at the Carolina Studio at 910-491-6405. Now, again, this program is brought to you by members of the Churches of Christ, and if you need any assistance in locating the congregation in your area, please feel free to contact us. Now, folks, get out your Bibles and stay along with us here on the Gospel Live radio show you're listening to the gospel light radio show before we go into our program for this evening i would ask you to bow with me in a word of prayer that we may thank god for this opportunity our most kind gracious loving heavenly father the father of our lord and savior jesus christ father we thank you for this day we thank you for allowing us to go through the various activities of the day and placing it on our hearts that we are on this broadcast and we're prepared now to present a portion of your holy and divine word. Father, thank you to our co-hosts on the show this evening, Glenn McMillian and Dr. Frank Washington Jr. as they break unto our listeners, the bread of life. And also my co-host, Yusuf Ford, who will be answering the question that on the hearts of so many. We just pray that you will bless them and their families that support their efforts. That they may continue to sow the seed. Of the kingdom. Father, we pray that you will be with our listeners who are tuning in via Blog Talk Radio as well as through social media. We pray that they may listen well, that they may consider their eternal stance before you, and that their hearts may be pricked. And it will cause them to ask the question, What must I do to be saved? Father, we thank you so much for sending your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, to die such a cruel death on Calvary's cross. We recognize that without such a sacrifice, we will not have a hope. Of eternal life. While even now we ask you to forgive us for the transgressions of our own heart. We know our flesh is weak, and we often fall short of thy will. For I pray you will continue to bless us and keep us and love us all the days of our lives. And that we have been faithful until death. For we pray that you will save us. For it's in Christ's name we do ask it all. Amen. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. 
In the first segment of the broadcast, my co-host Glenn McMillian, he serves with the Waterview Church of Christ in Richardson, Texas. He'll be making his proclamation of the gospel of Christ. And in the second segment, we have a question from my social media platform on Facebook called Shout It Out, and we'll be posing to my co-host Yusuf Ford. He serves as the evangelist for the Livingstone Church of Christ there in Indianapolis, Indiana. He'll be answering our question in that segment. And to close out the show, my co-host Dr. Frank Washington Jr., he serves with the West Broward Church of Christ there in Plantation, Florida, and he'll be making his proclamation of the gospel of Christ to close out the show. So open up your Bibles now and open your minds and let's have a great show after the break. The next voice you'll be that of my co-host, Glenn McMillian. Enjoy the show. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Give your attention to the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now my co-host, Glenn McMillian. Thank you, Steve. Uh, tonight, we are going to revisit a topic that I, I talked about a little while ago. If you are uh, a frequent uh, listener to the Gospel Light Radio Show, you'll know that a few months ago I did a uh, shout-it-out segment 
in which we were asked a question about uh, Isaiah chapter 65 and uh, Revelation chapter 21 to see whether there was a some kind of conflict between those two, two chapters. Um, in that lesson, I said that there was no conflict, uh, but uh, the person who, uh, who who submitted that question has uh, reached out to us again. He was not happy with uh, the answer that I gave. Apparently, I uh, misrepresented him in some way, and uh, I did not fully cover the topic. So tonight, we're going to spend a lot more time here, and we're going to look at uh, specifically uh, what this person has uh, said about uh, the, these two chapters and his understanding of uh, these these two passages uh, about the new heavens and the new earth, and we'll see uh, if he is <laughs> has a case to be made here, or if, we, if there are errors in, uh, in in biblical interpretation that he, that he is uh, perpetuating that. Uh, need to be addressed, um, and, and and that's really the reason why I'm bringing it to, here to you today and in, in, in doing this publicly. If it was a, a a private matter and I didn't think that there would be any benefit to anybody else, you know, I wouldn't deal with this. But I think that there are issues here that are are broadly applicable that that will help us to understand uh, how we read. Uh, Old Testament prophecy, how we can apply things from Old Testament prophecy in the New Testament age, and how we really shouldn't uh, try to do that. So let us start with the original question that he's asking here. And the question is that uh, to explain why we don't see a, a contradictory statement between the two passages, Isaiah chapter 65 and Revelation chapter 21. I'm not going to read both those uh, those chapters. They're fairly long. Um, but the key is that they both talk about uh, the new heavens and the new earth. And in Isaiah chapter 65, it is implied that uh, death is still a thing. It will be a, a rare event. It, it, it shows a picture of, of long life, children living to be over 100, and anybody who lives to less than 100 is, would be considered a curse, um, is, is what the verse says. And in Revelation 21, it says that there, every tear will be wiped from every eye. There will be no death, no sorrow, no pain. So in one hand, we have a situation where there is death, even if, it, if it's a long way off. And on the other one, there's no death. So if this, these two uh, chapters are dealing with the same thing when they reference the new heaven and the new earth, then how are these, these statements not in, not in contradiction with each other? And you'll, you'll notice the first problem right away. I said if, if these two chapters are talking about the same thing, then there would be a contradiction. Before you ask, ask if the, uh, before you ask the question about why is there not a contradiction here, you should be asking, are these two chapters talking about the same thing? Is there even a, a reason to believe that there would be a contradiction here? If, there, if these two chapters are not talking about the same thing, uh, if they're not addressing the same um, set of events, then there's no contradiction to be had. What he's doing here is, is a, a common uh, logical fallacy, a common uh, mistake that people make, and that is assuming the, the truth of a premise uh, that has not been proven and then basing further arguments on an unproven premise. Uh, they used to call this begging the question, although begging the question has kind of been made to mean something else colloquially, but it's assuming a conclusion that has not been proven, has not been argued, but he's going, he's going to assume that that's true and then build an argument on top of it, even though, from my perspective, he hasn't even made that case yet. So I just kind of want to let this sit with you. He, his 
physician, the doctoral physician, his, his understanding of this verse creates a problem. And then he wants to come to me and, and, and our show and, and ask us to solve the problem that his doctrinal position created um, without even asking whether or not that's a position that we share. And it is not. Um, so why am I saying that these, these two passages are different? Well, first of all, that's not my burden of proof to show. He's the one making the affirmative case. He's got the burden of proof to show that they are the same. But rather than being dismissive, let, let me make my case as to, say, as to why these things are not the same. Number one, they are two different contexts. Completely different time periods, completely different writers, completely different audiences. Um, there, there's nothing in this to suggest that they are the same, other than that phrase "a new heaven and a new earth." Uh, and that brings us to the second problem here: is that the just because we have a similar uh, word or similar phrase in two different passages of scripture or two different pr prophecies does not necessarily mean that those prophecies are linked. Uh, there are dozens of examples of this, but uh, there's a couple of easy ones that we can, can go to. In uh, Jeremiah, uh, prophecy of the, the Messiah, Jesus is talked about as the branch. Well, does that mean that every time we see a branch in Scripture, every time we see a branch in prophecy, it's talking about Jesus? Uh, you know, Jesus himself says that I, I am the vine and we are the branch. You are the branches, meaning individual Christians are branches. So, is he saying that we as Christians are are also the Messiah, are also equal to Jesus because he used that same language, the branch? Obviously, that doesn't. We're not Mormons, so we don't believe that that is true. Um, we can use another example: the, the lions. Jesus is called in prophecy the Lion of Judah, but Jesus says that Satan is a roaring lion who goes around looking for who he may devour. Does that mean that there's a connection between Jesus and Satan? That they are related in some way? We're not more. Maybe we need to do a lesson on Mormonism. <laughs> Um, and, and, and really get into this, this person's uh, theology. But no, there's, there's no connection between uh, Jesus and Satan. Jesus and Satan are not equal or the same just because the same language is used about them in prophecy. Jesus is, we are not Jesus. We are not related to Jesus like that, um, equal to Jesus, even though the same word branch is used about Jesus and about us. In, in scripture. So a a word picture, a, a metaphor, or a, a prophetic uh, image is relevant within its context. It's not necessarily linked to other prophecies because it's using the same imagery. Is that always the case? No, but it, you can't make the assumption that just because it's using the same language that there's some connection there. You have to have more evidence than that. Uh, and this is a, if, if you're familiar with this person's writings, this is a, a common thing that he does and a common mistake that he makes is linking multiple prophecies together that have nothing to do with each other just because there's a word or a phrase in common. And that is, if you make those types of assumptions and make those types of logical leaps, that's going to lead you down a path that you don't need to be going down. Uh, you're going to... Tie things together that are not necessarily supposed to be connected, and that's going to force you to draw other conclusions that are that will not be correct because you're not looking at the the item in its context to figure out what it's referring to in its context before you move on to something else. So that's that's just the, the framework of the question. So he's asking the question: Do we see a contradiction between? Uh, Isaiah 65 and Isaiah 20 and Revelation 21. Uh, like I said, you're, you're going to want to read those passages, put them side by side at, at some point after this, uh, and, and come back to this, this video recording 
or this audio, which however you're listening to it, and uh, and go for from there to this next section. So after we deal with the question, his first assertion is that whenever a writer in the New Testament invokes the context of an Old Testament passage, it carries the meaning that of that New Testament writer. Uh, it carries the meaning that the New Testament Testament writer applies to it into the New Testament. So this is true to a certain extent. It, it's true as far as it goes. When, if a New Testament writer quotes an Old Testament prophecy or an Old Testament scripture, they sometimes bring to it a new context, a, a new meaning to that scripture that it didn't have before. This, uh, most of the Messianic prophecies are like this. They, they had a meaning in the original context, but the New Testament reveals to us that there is a meaning of these, these passages that had something to do with Jesus or, or uh, the Messiah beyond the meaning that it originally had in its original context. And, and, and we know this is true. We know that this can be true. The problem that he is uh, bringing up is that he is trying to say that if you quote one verse in a passage, that necessarily means that the entire passage carries that New Testament context. And this is, uh, again, easily shown not to be true. When the New Testament writers quote a scripture from the Old Testament in the New Testament, that new context, that double fulfillment, only applies to the portion of scripture that they quote. It doesn't apply generally to the entire context of the passage that they're talking about. And again, we can demonstrate this rather easily um, with a couple of very well-known examples. Let's start with Isaiah 40, uh, verses uh, 6 to 8. This is a this is quoted in uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 4 through 7, where the Hebrew writer says, For it is impossible for the bulls and goats, the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, You have not desired to sacrifice an offering, but you have prepared a body for me. You have not taken pleasure in whole burnt offerings for, in, for sin. Then, he, then I said, Behold, I have come. It is written of me in the scroll of the book to do your will, O God. So, this is, uh, again, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 5 through 7. This is quoting from Isaiah, or sorry, Psalms chapter 40, uh, verses 6 through 8. Again, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have opened, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Then I say, here I am, I have come. It is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, my God. Your law is within my heart. So we see that these are parallel passages. So, and that this I... The Hebrew writer tells us is referring to Jesus himself. So, according to our friend's uh, philosophy here, everywhere we see I in Psalms 40 would necessarily have to uh, refer to Jesus because it refers to Jesus in verses 6 through 8. It must refer to Jesus for the rest of the chapters, the rest of the passage. But we know that this is not the case it's because if we get to verse 12, what does it say? For troubles without number surround me, my sins have overtaken me, and I cannot see. So are we going to say that this passage applies to Jesus because chapter because verse 6 and, six and 7 apply to Jesus? Did Jesus have sin? Was he blind and could not see? See, you, you start getting into dangerous territory when you start making these assumptions and these logical leaps. The, the, yes, this, these three verses are quoted in the New Testament, and they are given meaning beyond this context. But that doesn't bring the entire passage with it. The rest of the passage is locked into its old, its old uh, context. We only have New Testament context for the verses that are quoted and revealed to have New Testament context. Let's give us another example. Psalm 69. Psalm 69 is an even stronger case, right? Psalm 69 is quoted three different times in three different places in the New Testament. 
Uh, verse 4, those who hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. That is quoted in John 15, verse 25. This happened so that the word is, is written in their law would be fulfilled. They hated me without a reason. So we see a direct verse 9, for zeal for your house has consumed me. That's quoted in John 2, verse 17. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So, 69, verse 4, and 69, verse 9, and then verse 21. For my thirst, they gave me vinegar for to drink. And we all know where that is. That's Matthew chapter 27, 34. They gave him wine mixed with bile to drink, and after tasting it, he was unwilling to drink it. So we see Psalm 69 played out three different in three different verses quoted three different places in the New Testament. So that's a strong case to say, look, this whole chapter must have relevance to Jesus. So every time we see I and me in in Psalm 69, it must be referring to Jesus, right? Look at verse 5. It says, God, you know my foolishness, and my guilt is not hidden from you. What if, <laughs> if, if we make that assumption, if we say that Psalm 69 refers to Jesus in its entirety because we see all of these quotations being applied to Jesus, then how do we deal with verse 5? We'd have to say that Jesus was a sinner, that he that he had guilt that needed to be de- dealt with. And we know that that's not true. So we can see that there is a danger in overplaying our hand when, when it comes to uh, – Biblical prophecy. The New Testament does pull from Old Testament prophecy. It does reveal that there is double meaning and dual fulfillment as these prophecies are also applied to Jesus and applied to uh, the Messiah. But it doesn't necessarily mean that the entire passage also has that meaning and also comes forward with that with that context. It's only the passages that are revealed to have that context are pulled forward. So it, it is dangerous to, to make those kinds of logical leaps. And again, this is something that if you look at the, the writings of, of this man and, and the Peterist movement that he's a part of, this is something that they do all the time. They will over uh, extend these pro- prophetic uh, language so that they're bringing things into the New Testament context that aren't revealed to to be there or aren't revealed to be part of the New Testament context. So the only texts that, that are revealed to have New Testament context are the ones that we are told have New Testament context. You can't make the assumption uh, that beyond them uh, without a lot of evidence to go along with it. So we're we're already in a part where we're we're assuming (laughs) conclusions that haven't been proven. We're bringing in context for verses that don't belong here. Uh, So what else are we are we going to see uh, from this uh, from this investigation of this topic? So he's going to bring Peter in. So he says Peter makes it perfectly clear that the new heavens and new earth that he was waiting for was spoken in the prophets. Uh, okay, is that true? So, yes, Peter does talk about the new heavens and the new earth, and that is in Second Peter chapter three. So we're, we'll look at this passage because it's fairly short. So Second Peter chapter three, starting at verse ten. The day of the Lord will come like a thief, and in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat. And the earth and its works will be discovered. Since all these things are going to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy context and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat? But according to his promise, we are looking for the new heavens and the new earth in which righteousness dwells. So again, we have here using this common language, a new heavens and a new earth. 
But again, common language does not necessarily mean that we're talking about the same thing. But he's, he's saying that there is prophecy in history. No, there's nothing in, in these verses here that talks about prophecy. It talks about this promise. We're looking for a promise. But he also mentions a lot of other things that are not part of the text of Isaiah chapter 65. All this, all this stuff about burning and heat and elements passing away and, and destruction None of that is part of the Isaiah 65 content. So if you're going to say that Isaiah 65 and 3 are, are necessarily related based on this word promise and, and this phrase, new heavens and a new earth, you'd have to say where is the connection between what was going on in Isaiah 65 and what's going on here other than this, this phrase, new heavens and new earth. None, none of those things are quoted. Again, we, we, we brought up the fact that you're, you're, you're asserting that because of this phrase, new heavens and new earth, that these two chapters have to be related. And because they have to be related, we have to bring the entire context of Isaiah chapter 65 into this New Testament framework. But we've already shown that that doesn't work. You can't bring the entire context. You can only bring the, the, the verses that are actually quoted and actually revealed to be part of the New Testament context. So if we look at Isaiah 65, first, uh, 2 Peter 3, and Revelation 21 side by side, and we ask ourselves which verses are actually quoted from Isaiah 65 and, and are brought into this new text of the context? And the answer to that is zero. <laughs> None of those verses are actually quoted in here in, in 2 Peter 3 or in Revelation 21. Other than this phrase, new heavens and new earth, there is no connection between Isaiah 65, 1 Peter, or 2 Peter 3, and Revelation 21. So there's nothing in Isaiah 65 that necessarily has New Testament connotation, other than this passage, uh, other than this phrase, "New Heavens and New Earth." In that phrase, in and of itself, doesn't carry <laughs> the weight that he thinks it does. Um, it, there, there's no connection. There, there's no. There's Nothing that necessarily tells us that these, this is the same event being talked about in each of these three, uh, three passages, and it's arguable that it's a different event in each of the, in each of the three passages. Although there's some question about uh, Peter and John's uh, interpretation be, may may be the same or not, but they they are both different from Isaiah's. So, and we'll get to that later. So that brings us to kind of his conclusion and his ultimate point here. The point that he's trying to make and the, and the, and the reason why he, he needs this connection to be made is that, again, if these are talking about the same event, if, if the new heavens and the new earth is the same event in, in Isaiah 65 and in Revelation 21. That creates an apparent contradiction, right? Because one talks about death being still being around, even though it's far off. And the other one talks about there being no death. And so how do you have death and no death in the same context? Which he is talking about, we're being inconsistent, but the only inconsistency is the inconsistency that, that he's creating by assuming that those two things are the same as it. So he's saying that the, there is a way to resolve this. And the way he is telling us has to resolve this is that Isaiah is talking about physical death and John is talking about spiritual death. Which, you know, in and of itself is not 
a is not an awful way of, of dealing with that. But again, it's unnecessary <laughs> because you, number one, you haven't proven that these are the same event, and number two, uh, that brings up a whole host of other problems, especially when we get to Revelation. Um, if you're saying that this is a, a, a situation where what, I, where what Revelation 21 is saying has spiritual meaning, uh, then let's look at what this verse actually says, the whole thing. And it says, uh, verse 4 of Revelation 21, he will wipe every tear away from their eyes. There will no longer be any death. No longer will there be any mourning or crying or pain, for the first things have passed away. Okay? So if, if there's no death in this context, there's also no mourning, no crying, no pain. All of, the, all of those things also go away. And then we see a little bit of parallel in Isaiah 65 to that, but it's not a direct parallel. Um, so we can't make the case that those things are the same, again, from this verse, from this passage. There's also the a problem <laughs> in verse one where it says the new we saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first earth passed away and there's no longer any sea. Um, and again, we have to explain. Okay, if you're going to explain the no death part means that there's no more spiritual spiritual death. First of all, what does the no sea part mean? There's no longer any spiritual sea. What is what is the spiritual sea? Um, how does how does that relate to anything? How do how do you explain it? And then, what does it mean? What are the implications of the fact that there is no longer any spiritual death? Again, the reason why he's making this case, I, and I I thought I think I mentioned this earlier, but if I didn't, let me make it explicit. The reason why he's making this case and the reason why he wants us to draw this conclusion is because he believes that all of these events have already happened, that, that the, uh, the judgment, the resurrection, the final resurrection, the ultimate reward for Christians, all of those things have already taken place. And we are now living in this new heaven and new earth. And so when he's saying that there, he's trying to make the case that, that this is true, and we know that it's true, because there is physical death, physical death still exists, but spiritual death has gone away. So what, what is spiritual death? What is, what is he talking about here? Well, spiritual death is the separation from God that happens when we sin. And so when we sin, we become separated from God. That that separation has to be uh, atoned for by the blood of Christ. And we, when we participate in baptism, when we contact the blood of Christ, then we are resurrected into new life, and we are spared. We are saved from spiritual death. That is the traditional Christian understanding of spiritual death. If you are implying that there is no more spiritual death because it has passed away, then that means that process becomes irrelevant, right? There's no more need for us to repent and be baptized into the body of Christ because we were never spiritually dead. So there's no need for a spiritual resurrection. We're already in fellowship with God, and, and if there's no way to die, to die spiritually, then there's no way for us to be separated from God. That is <laughs> what uh, we would normally call uh, universal salvation. And if not, why not? Now, the Bible doesn't teach universal salvation. It, it, it does teach warnings against uh sinful behavior because that's going to lead you down the road where you can be lost because spiritual death is still a thing. But if 
what he's he's saying is true. If, if spiritual death ended in in AD seventy, and we are in this new heaven and new earth era where there is no spiritual death, then what's the point? <laughs> what's what's why are you why are you even having this conversation? If no one can be lost and if no one can be separated from God spiritually, then then why are we here? Why are we even bothering you? And he and I know he doesn't actually believe that because he's still preaching, he's still doing the stuff, he's he's still trying to convince me and you that his position is true. Which he wouldn't need to if universal salvation if there is no spiritual death. And again, he's going to get, he's going to claim that I'm misrepresenting his position. I'm not misrepresenting the position. I am bringing out the logical conclusion of having this position. If you you yourself said that we are in a position where there is now no more spiritual death, spiritual death has ended. What that means is. There's no more sin. There's no more, uh, there may be sin, but there is no more consequence of sin. And again, if not, why not? That's the question that remains unanswered. That's the question that I asked in my original (laughs) uh, topic on uh, the the original lesson that I did on 8070, where I told you that this is what they believe. This is the logical conclusion of their theology. And this is the question that they're never going to answer. He wants to ask me this question about Isaiah 65 so that if I accept his premise that these are the same events and then if I accept his reasoning that the only way to resolve this conflict is that physical death remains but spiritual death ends then the conclusion is that we, we can accept a situation where we have already entered into this new heavens and new earth and yet still see physical death. Because the death that he's talking about, there is no more death, is not physical, it's spiritual. But again, you don't deal with the other side of that. What does it mean that there is no more spiritual death? If you don't answer that question, you're not really... uh, Addressing the issue, you're not really understanding the full implication of what your doctrine is, and the implications of that doctrine are are going to pull you away from traditional Christianity or what the Bible actually teaches about sin and judgment and the need for uh, repentance, the need for reconciliation uh, back to God. So since we have a little bit of time, let's deal with, so what is this new heavens and new earth? What is it actually trying to say? <laughs> if our friend's interpretation and our understanding of this is flawed, then how do we come to a better understanding of it? What is Isaiah 65 actually saying? What is Revelation 21 actually saying? And can we have any kind of understanding of what's actually going on. So remember the context. Isaiah 65 is written to uh, the Jews who are in Babylonian captivity. They have been under Babylonian captivity. I think they were there for a period of 70-something years. Um, That the whole generation has come and gone without being free being under uh, the rule of uh, some, some foreign dictators. But God promised them that they would, they would come out the other side of it. So Isaiah 65 is telling them that even though things look bad now, even though we, we are under, under this pressure, God is going to Make things new. He's going to. You're going to be released. You're going to be able to breathe again. To be, <laughs> be able to live your 
lives and freedom again. And that is the that is the message of Isaiah 65, that the new heaven and new earth is representative of a paradigm shift. It's representative of refreshing. Think your your whole understanding, your concept of reality, the way things are, is going to change because the conditions that you are in are going to be are going to go away. And you're going to be restored out of captivity into freedom. And it, it will be like there is a new heaven and a new earth. It, it, everything will be will seem new to you because you are free from your former oppression. And so what we see in Revelation 21 is John is borrowing that language. He's not writing to the Jews in captivity in Babylon, but he is writing to Christians who are under persecution that we see uh, prophesied throughout the book of Revelation, that the, that the region in which he is writing is going to under, undergo severe persecution. The next Roman emperor, he is warning them that this, that, this, that this persecution is coming. He is encouraging them to stay faithful. And then he gives them this picture of a new heaven and earth because the, the, the persecution was going to be temporary. And after the final, uh, the 11th Roman emperor had fallen, they would be enter into a, a position of, of relative freedom. Of, um, there's not, not going to be the same level of persecution on Christians as there were as there was during this time where they were literally trying to wipe the entire movement off of the face of the earth. You see why the the, the language is brought. The, the the situation is somewhat similar. It's not the same. This this is captivity versus you know persecution. It's it's, a, it's slightly different. But the feeling of being under somebody's guilt, the feeling of being constantly under threat the feeling of this will never end, it's never going to change. Those things, those two populations would have had in common. And so this language of the new heaven and new earth that brought comfort to Old Testament Israel would have been known and would have been familiar to the New Testament audience, even though he's writing to Gentiles who may or may not fully pick up on it without some help from their uh, Jewish friends. But regardless, he's borrowing that language, and he's using it to give the same picture, the same feeling, the same evocation to the New Testament audience to tell them that what you're going through is temporary. What you're going through is going to be unpleasant, but you're going to come out of it on the other side and things are going to get better. And we might as well throw Second Peter in there as we, if we're going to talk about it. It's the same exact thing, right? Second Peter, what is the, the whole theme of First and Second Peter is dealing with and, and staying faithful to God under persecution. And so that's why I said there's, there's a lot of tie-in between what, Second Peter is talking about what John is talking about in Revelation 21. My feeling is that they're they're more related. They're they're more likely to be talking about the same thing, um, but it's not what they were talking about in Isaiah 65. Similar, being under constant oppression is similar to what the, the Israelites were doing when they were in under captivity. There are the suffering that 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 Peter talks about is similar. <clears throat> To the oppression that the, the, the Old Testament Jews were under, but it's not the same. It's not the same event. These, they're separated by hundreds of years, um, but the feeling is similar, and, and the the relief that's going to come when they get out of it, when they pass through it, is similar. So, again, we we have to. Understand each of these things in their context. 
we can make connections. The, the common language allows us to make some connections that we can't over-assume and bring in things into the New Testament context that don't belong to them. We can't over-apply prophetic language and, and prophetic imagery to places and to things that it doesn't actually apply to. We have to limit our, our understanding of prophecy to the context in which it applies. And then if we have evidence that it applies elsewhere based on revelation that it's called back and it's explicitly told to us, this is what the prophets were actually talking about. We, it, it's not on our – it's beyond the scope of, of what we know and what we can uh, do to say, okay, the prophets the, – the book doesn't actually say that this is what's happening, but I'm going to uh, – to, make this, this Old Testament verse fit into this New Testament context and then change the meaning of what the New Testament is saying based on this word picture that, that I put together. But that's not proper <laughs> uh, uh, exegesis of the text. Um, so there's not much more to say, say about that. Um, I, hopefully that is, that is that is helpful for you. I think we've identified several things that this person has done wrong that we can avoid doing in our personal Bible study. We can't assume things that we haven't proven. We can't pull content, text out of their context and apply them elsewhere based on just because they're similar language or just because there is a, a close quote or a quote from elsewhere in, the, in a passage. We can only apply what the Bible tells us is supposed to be applied here. And if we avoid doing that, we'll avoid drawing conclusions based on something that's going on in the Old Testament that we want to pull into the New Testament that doesn't actually, it's not actually applicable to the, the New Testament context. The New Testament brings in very specifically the things that it wants to bring in that it's telling us these things belong to us. Everything else belongs in the context in which it was uh, revealed. So I hope that makes sense. The lesson is yours. If we have further questions on this, uh, feel free to contact us here at the Gospel Light Radio Show, we, we, and we, we will try to address it as, as best we can. Um, but I think I fully... <laughs> Dealt with this chapter, Isaiah 65, probably the uh, the last word on that, unless uh, there's some compelling word, compelling reason for me to bring it publicly to you. Uh, that's it for me. Uh, keep listening to the Gospel Lights Radio Show. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. I'm not ashamed to live for Jesus, it's the best life, that's for sure. I'm not ashamed to defend his name, cause he died for mine and yours. He gave his promise, died in honor, that he committed to stay on the cross. And one day I'm gonna stand beside him and thank him for the blood he Jesus, I'm not ashamed to trust Him. Save the 
way I think it ought to be. But we ain't arguing if it's wrong or right, so don't judge us by what you see on the news at night. They quick to say a rapper been shot down. It ain't a rapper put the six feet in the ground. It's the life they live. The killers be killers to make the whole rap the same thing. Yeah. We started rapping just to say so. Bring some folks closer to the Lord. Closer He gets to you, the more He make you see. When you give Him what you got, you can gain a victory. So money and clothes, now I really don't care. You can go on with the things that I'm trying to get up there where I can walk down them streets to go. Put my sword in the sand and let go of the heavy load. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Shout it out question. I have a question from my social media platform on Facebook called Shout It Out. And my co-host, you support, he serves as the evangelist for the Livingstone Church of Christ in Indianapolis, Indiana. And we also want to encourage our listeners to get involved in those biblical discussions in that group on social media now the question that we have for my co-host Yusuf Ford this is a question from an anonymous querist from the state of North Carolina and his question is when someone asks you a question concerning your old man life and now that you are a Christian under your new crea- creation life new creature life rather if you answer no under your Christian life would it be truthful even if you use it to do it under the old man or sinful lifestyle? Very interesting question. What say you to this question, uh, you, sir? Good evening, brothers and sisters, brother Stevie, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'd like to wish you all a very happy Thursday. I hope today finds you well. The angel announced to the shepherd or the shepherds on Jesus' birthday, fear not, for behold, I bring good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Today is another celebration of, of life. Let's all praise God for that. To share a passage from the book of Joel, he wrote, fear not, old land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Joel 2, verse 22. Amen. God is in the do good things business. <laughs> um, I, I am blessed tonight to have this opportunity to address the anonymous question, again, which is uh, someone asked. Uh, when someone asks a question concerning your old man life, now that you are a Christian under the new Christian life, if you answer no under your Christian life, would you be truthful even if you used to do things uh, under uh, of the old man in the sinful life? So um, to answer that question, I want to begin with a story. I was It was my great fortune. I was truly blessed to meet Sister Keeble, which was the wife of the late Marshall Keeble. And Marsha, as he was known, if you, if you didn't know, was a great pioneer, a legend in the Church of Christ. He was an African-American preacher who grew up in the South, and he was a great, wonderful, amazing, parable preacher. I have many of his his recordings and books um, and writings, and I remember he told the story of of a, a gentleman down in the South that he baptized, and just to just to note, uh, Marshall Keeble baptized over forty thousand people, maybe sixty. I mean, the numbers kind of fluctuate uh, depending on who you ask. But he established over 350 congregations, and through his leadership role at Nashville Christian Institute, he raised what was known as powerful sons in the faith. And his influence can still be seen today in the leadership of that generation. And the next, 
who were mentored to continue in his footsteps. And Marshall was a tremendous power, a, a tremendous influence in the church uh, in his years in the ministry. And so uh, back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, we had what were called tent meetings and revivals. Some call them revivals or gospel meetings or that sort of thing, especially in the South. And during one of those tent meetings, Brother Keeble told the story of a man he baptized, which I'll share with you on this particular night or week of this meeting, this man walked in who struggled with alcoholism and abuse. And as a result, he would often beat his wife. And alcoholism and, and alcohol destroys lives, ladies and gentlemen. It dr- destroys careers. It destroys families and marriages. And so, I, you know, that's that's something we should stay away from. <clears throat> well, anyway, this, you know, this gentleman comes into the tent and he sits there, hears the gospel or the lesson that night, comes back several nights. And as I understand this, uh, the the story, he later surrendered to baptism and Brother Marshall Keeble baptized him. Some of you may have heard this story. But uh, the gentleman went home and he was met by his father-in-law at the door. And his father-in-law said, you're not welcome in this house anymore. And you're, you know, your alcohol has become a problem. You're beating up on my wife, uh, on my daughter, and you're never going to, you're never going to do that again. And the gentleman looked at his father-in-law and said, I never did it. So <laughs> that's, I think that's where the, the anonymous question is going with this. We often hear this question and, and hear this statement as members of the church. And I think that derives from Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, which we'll get to in a minute. But the idea that we're a new creature is both metaphoric and true. Man is made up of a threefold being. He's made up of body, soul, and spirit. And in case you're wondering about the references, then you can write these down. I often throw scriptures out there that you can look at. <clears throat> One is Job 32, verse 8. Uh, Job talks about the spirit of man, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7. Of course, I love that entire that entire chapter uh, about remembering the Lord, remembering the Lord in the days of your youth. And then it talks about the body or the returning to the dust as it were or as it was another reference would be first corinthians chapter 13 verse 3 another one would be ephesians chapter 4 verse 4 which is a great reference and then another one would be matthew chapter 22 verse 37 where jesus talks about the soul of man so man is both body soul and spirit and some people would say well man has a soul that's incorrect. Man is a soul that has a body. So when Paul says to the church in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, he's writing from experience, and that verse says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. So he is, in essence, saying man is new in the sense that he has a new life. He has new thinking and he has new ways. So the question is, when someone asks asks you concerning your old man life, now that you are Christian in your new creature life or new creation life or created life, if you answer no under your Christian life, would you be truthful even if you used to do things under the old man or sinful lifestyle? The answer is yes and no, depending on the text in which you answer it. It is both true and untrue, depending on how you intend to express your meaning. And let me give you an example of that. <clears throat> Say a person was in prison for committing armed robbery. After 10 years in prison time, of prison time, they hear the gospel and surrender to baptism. At that point and moment, they are a new creature, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. What God may have done or what in this conversion process is invisible to the naked eye, even though something happened. Now, if it happened in the spiritual sense, in the physical spiritual form, we can't see it. So 
when a person is baptized, they do and become they do become a new creature. So that person in prison became a new creature, but then they asked to see the warden and explain to them that the crimes of which they've been accused and in, in prison for are false because they never committed the crime. That statement would be untrue, it would be false. They are a new creature. But as someone explained to me years ago, sometimes our spiritual man suffers for what the physical man has done. And the same thing would be true with many of us. After spending many years in the church in the service of the Lord, we see people who lived in our past lives that expect us to respond to them as we did once. And we do not because we have changed, because we live different standards of and have different rules of life and different lifestyles. So think about the Apostle Paul in his old life, the one that's writing this this chapter and this verse to the church at Corinth. Paul was introduced to us in the book of Luke or in the book of Acts by Luke. And he was part of a group of religious leaders that wrongfully imprisoned and killed a saint in the early church. And after his speech, uh, Stephen's speech and testimony, they themselves, being guilty of misinterpreting the scriptures, sentenced him. And the Bible tells us in Acts chapter five or chapter seven. Let me pull up in verse fifty-seven and uh, fifty-seven through sixty, I believe. <clears throat> it says, and they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Verse 60. This was Saul's mission to destroy the church of Christ. Paul himself later wrote after his conversion for ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited in the Jews' religion of many of my equals in my own nation being more exceeding zealous of the traditions of my fathers. Galatians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. And he also wrote this chilling passage. This is a couple. First, trip, uh, First Timothy chapter 1, verse 12 and Acts chapter 22, verse 4. He says, and I thank Christ Jesus, my Lord, who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me in the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. He hurt people deliberately. And this chilling verse in verse uh, chapter 22 and 4 of Acts, and I persecuted this way into the death, binding and delivering into prison both men and women. He did not care. He did not care. Their age, their their sex, he was going to he was going to hurt them. That was his mission. That's that was his quest. And so he was on that road to Damascus, having received letters from that same group to bring these men and women bound back into Jerusalem. But as we say, he was on the Damascus road of change. And if you know his story, you know what happened next. Now, this reminds me of what Paul or what David wrote in Psalms 51, verse 10, when he wrote, creating me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. So that's what happened to Saul. This is what happened to Saul of Tarsus. He was a new creature. He was a new creature. But he was a new creature with a horrible past. In fact, he proclaimed in the, uh, his, uh, his new life to the disciples and they knew of his change, but no one was buying it. And in Acts chapter 9, verse 26, it says, And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. It was one of the, uh, one of the leaders had to introduce him to the brethren and the leaders at, um, at Jerusalem at that time. He wrote, he wrote about that in Galatians, I think, 14 years later, he went up to Jerusalem. So Barnabas was the, the, the man who introduced him to the disciples and to the leaders in Jerusalem because Barnabas was a notable man in the church. But again, 
Paul's past caught up with him. So the point to uh, that I'm making here is be careful how you use the reference and just be honest. Be aware of the fact that we can change our lives and our future, but we cannot erase our past uh, under right um, some legal circumstances, I guess. We can have our convictions overturned or expunged, but they're still in the system somewhere. The new, cre- the new cre- uh, creation or the new creature is a spiritual reflection of how, we, of how God sees us and not how people see us. We are new creatures. Simply, um, that simply means, I'm sorry, a new lifestyle. Now that verse has a direct is the direct twin, I guess you would say, to that scripture in Second Corinthians chapter five or seventeen would be Ephesians chapter four, verse twenty two. If I might share this before my conclusion, it says that you put off concerning the form of conversation. Conversation means life, the life that you're living. It doesn't mean talking. It means your lifestyle. It means your life. That you put off your concerning the form of conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So it's talking about your life. Your life is new. Your thinking is new. Your actions are new. Because there are people, to be honest with you, that are in the church and have been in the church, I'll say, in the assembly, (laughs) <laughs> for many years, but they haven't changed. I've known quite a few people that were in the pew, in the pew, sitting in the pews, but were more corrupt than the people that they that they were pointing the finger at, which we say in the world. Hadn't changed the lick. Still in there for 40 or 50 years and still acting the same, talking the same, doing the same things, acting the same way, have the same thoughts, et cetera, et cetera. So, I wouldn't get just because you were baptized does not necessarily mean that you are a new creature. And so here's clear language here in Ephesians chapter four of what Paul was referring to in second Corinthians chapter five, that this life that you're now living, the new creature life or the new creation is a life of righteousness and holiness. So in conclusion, consider who you're speaking to and the message you're trying to convey. God bless you. God strengthen you. And God leads you. Thank you, Brother Stevie. Thank you also for allowing me to share my thoughts. Shout it out question. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. This is a program reminder. Stevie B. Media Production presents. We're airing live shows here on Blog Talk Radio. The telephone number to the live show is 713 955 0508. And our, the Blog Talk uh, the website is www.blogtalkradio.com forward slash gospel light radio show. On Tuesday evening, I'm hosting a live show, What a Woman the Lord radio show. And this show will air every second, third, and fourth Tuesday of the month and also on the second Tuesday of the month this show will air from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time 5 to 7 p.m. Central Standard Time and on the second Tuesday of the month we have a guest speaker from the Brotherhood of the Church of Christ who will be making a proclamation of the Gospel of Jesus Christ and also during that show we have the Community Corner segment that segment is designed for small business owners and entrepreneurs who have products and services for our communities also have two co-hosts on that show uh, Lou Gilbert, he serves as the evangelist for the Oberg Park Church of Christ there in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And Isa Mullins, he serves Church of Christ there in Cary, North Carolina. And then on the third Tuesday of the month, my co-host, Dr. Antherica Lane, she's a board-certified obstetricianist and gynecologist. She serves the Great Road Church of Christ there in Cincinnati, Ohio. And her show will air at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time. And she'll be hosting her show, Conversations with Dr. Lane. And on the fourth Tuesday of the month, 
we have the, my co-host Kelly Fletcher. She serves the Livingstone Church of Christ there in Indianapolis, Indiana. She'll be hosting her show, The Kelly Fletcher Show. And that show will air at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time. Then on Thursday evening, each week from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 5 to 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, I'll be hosting a live show, the Gospel Light Radio Show. And there are eight co-hosts on that show, Clay Phillips, Yusuf Ford, Dr. Frank Washington Jr., Steve Cotto, Stanley Hubbard, Johnny Morrison, and Glenn McMillian and Brian Christian Coleman will be presenting lessons from the Word of God. And each week I have two of my co-hosts on that show with me. And I'm also taking a question from my social media platform on Facebook called Shout It Out that I'll be posing to one of my co-hosts on that live show. Then on Friday night, I'll be hosting a live show, Stevie B, a fellow gospel music blast radio show. And this show is the 2022 recipient for the Nakama National Academy of Christian a fellow music arts award for outstanding achievement in record or radio. And on this show, I'm playing some of the world's greatest a fellow gospel music artists, the sweet sounds of voices. And uh, I'll be also debuting new music and featuring old music as well. And every third Friday of the month, I'll be doing my Top 20 Countdown show, and I have on-demand episodes as well. These, there's just a variety of musical platforms that you can go to. Uh, Spotify. Now we picked up on Pandora as well, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, Apple iTunes, just to name a few. And also, we have recorded version shows. These shows were album debuts mostly, and the same playlist that's used on the live show on Blog Talk Radio you can hear on these recorded version shows. And these shows want to be heard on iHeartRadio, Deezer, and also on Amazon Music. We also want to thank our sponsors who are sponsoring these radio shows. If you would like to become a sponsor, just contact my sponsorship manager, Michelle Marco, and she can be contacted at 954-687-4705. The three E's of Stevie B Media Productions, it is the objective of this broadcast. We want to educate, we want to edify, we want to encourage you in the study of God's Word. And that will conclude our program announcements. You're listening to the Gospel Live radio show you're listening to the gospel light radio show you're listening to the gospel light radio show give your attention to the proclamation of the gospel of jesus christ now my co-host dr frank washington jr Good evening, brothers and sisters. Thank you, Brother Stevie, for this opportunity. I hope all is well. Uh, Last week, or the last time we spoke, we talked about the levels of hell. I briefly talked about the levels of hell and uh, the levels of punishment that will be uh, conducted in hell by a just God. Um, I'd like to add just a few more uh, pieces of information to, to this lesson so we can get a clearer understanding of will there be levels, different levels of punishment in hell for people who uh, have committed sin and know not God. Because the punishment of hell will be in keeping with, and keep this clear, it will be in keeping with divine justice. That's God's divine justice. And the all-knowing God will assess each individual life, uh, counting exactly the extent uh, of abandonment to sin, Uh, those with the influence of others to sin, and the light and privilege abused. And God will assign punishment accordingly, exactly fitted to each person. Now, although the suffering will be severe and everlasting for all those in hell, the specific degrees of punishment and suffering will differ in accordance with the measure of sin that one has in their life and the extent of one's sinful influence on others and the amount of gospel light that was rejected. The Bible authors are clear that hell is a place of divine judgment on sinners. Furthermore, many authors, quite a few scholars, uh, speak of more and less severe degrees of punishment, depending on a number of factors uh, in one's life. And these factors include the extent to which a person has abandoned, as I said in the introduction, a person has abandoned uh, himself or herself to sin, uh, the extent of uh, that person's influence on other people towards sin, you know, those who cause people to sin, and the amount of knowledge of the truth that uh, uh, one has uh, or one had or and, and rejected. But this is not to say that 
hell would be less than perfect torment for some, but scripture indicates that some will have a greater capacity for suffering or that some will bear a fiercer measure of the wrath of God uh, upon them. And so the Bible writers and, and our Lord himself frequently described hell as a place of divine judgment on sinners. And in multiple passages, we find that the ideas of punishment, wrath, retribution, and vengeance are prominent. Matthew 5.22 is an example. Uh, Mark 9.43, uh, Matthew 23.33, uh, Luke 13.28, we have more in 1 Thessalonians 5, uh, first, I'm sorry, 1 Thessalonians 1, 5 through 10. Now, the purpose of hell is not that of rehabilitation of the sinner <clears throat> or even the obliteration of evil. The purpose is retributive justice, meaning the punishment of God <clears throat> on sinners. Excuse me. The biblical writers are not content, however, to speak of hell broadly in terms of uh, divine justice and retribution. Sometimes they go further and insist that the divine justice in hell would be specifically fitted to the guilt of each individual offender. And 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 tonight we're going to explore uh, that teaching. And I want to take you uh, on a journey. Uh, I want you to track this with me uh, with these four uh, basic steps. Now, step number one, biblical evidence of the concept of degrees of punishment in hell. Number two, clarification. What is meant by degrees of punishment? Number three, the reason for degrees of punishment. Number four, the basis for determining degrees of punishment. All right. Now, let's go to school. Biblical evidence for the concept of degrees of punishment. Now, I'm going to uh, provide some passages of scripture that speak directly of degrees of punishment in hell. And here, I think I did a little bit of this last time I spoke to you, uh, to you great audience, but here we're going to just cite the verses again to establish the teaching and principle. Uh, then we're going to draw on them for uh, specific exposition uh, and application. So, number one, Matthew ten fifteen. Truly I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. And the second, the other verse is Matthew eleven twenty two twenty four. 24. But I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon that, than for you. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. Matthew twelve thirty six uh, through 37. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account of every careless word they speak. For by your words, you will be justified. And by your words, you will be uh, condemned. But because of your heart, and, and Romans 2, 5, because of your hand or your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment uh, will be Revealed. And finally, Hebrews 10.29, how much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace? Those are the verses that we look at uh, to give you examples of evidence for the concept of degrees of punishment. But then we go on to clarification. What is meant by degrees uh, of punishment? Well, these statements of degrees of punishment in hell are not meant to suggest that there shall be anything less than perfect misery for every soul in hell. For every person in hell, I promise you, it will be a place of weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth, according to Matthew 8 and 12. And uh, also Revelation 14 and 11, uh, and this suffering will be forever. There's not going to be a timeout period. It's going to be, that suffering is going to be forever. But no one will have to have it easy. I mean, hell will be a place of torment and it will be a place of misery for everybody who goes there. Precisely how the degrees of punishment will be given out is not told to us. But scripture indicates plainly enough 
that some will have a greater capacity for suffering or that some will actually bear a fiercer measure of the positive infliction of the wrath of God upon them. All the hosts will suffer for their sin, for some that suffer that will be worse than others. Now, here's the reason for the degrees of sin. The infliction of punishment proportionately, proportionately, in degrees, is an outworking of divine justice. Now, Scripture repeatedly affirms that God will judge in righteousness. God will do the judging. We can't send people to hell. And if you're trying to send people to hell, you're doing the wrong thing because it is not within your power. It, and I say this again, it is not within your power. It's not within the power of a preacher. It's not within the power uh, of, of an elder, uh, a Sunday school teacher. It's, they don't, no one has the power to uh, send someone to hell. Only God is going to be able to judge that, that individual and he will judge it in righteousness. In Acts 17.31 And that it is a function of God's justice and glory to avenge every wrong. Now, friends, it is in the interest of divine justice that punishment will be given out according to the nature of, a, of the offense. Now, we see a reflection of this, for example, in the Old Testament law, which prescribed more severe punishment for premeditated murder than for accidental homicide. Uh, so also Moses, uh, even in Moses' law, prescribed measures for restitution of various offenses, the nature of the crime, the attending motivation, and the varying circumstances all determine the measure of punishment. And this explains why Scripture sometimes repeatedly insists that judgment will be according to the works. Romans 2 and verse 6. And that in judgment, the books, the record books, will be open. Right? Now, there seems to be uh, no point on this matter other than that of determining the measure of accumulated guilt. And that for uh, the assigning the appropriate measure or measurement of punishment. And this is why God the judge will take into consideration the works, the words, and even the thoughts and motives of the sinners. Okay? Now, judgment is not merely for determining who is in and who is out. Uh, it is for measuring guilt and assigning punishment that is measured exactly what every individual sinner deserves. Okay? Uh, I hope you're still tracking this with me. Now we're going to go on to the basis for determining degrees of punishment. Now, what then will be the basis on which degrees of punishment will be determined, Doc? Well, uh, Scripture sets forth uh, at least three considerations. The extent to which a person has abandoned himself to sin. We've given up. Uh, we, we, we are at the point of uh, just, fall, just, just I don't want to say falling in love with sin, but we've just given ourselves over to sin. And so in this first consideration, that's the ex this is the extent of abandonment to sin. This concept is entailed in Matthew 5.21 and other passages that indicate degrees of sin. Worse sins result in worst punishment. This seems clearly to be the point in Romans 2.5, which says, uh, Because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. So what can this mean but that every sin committed is like making a deposit in the bank and that in the day of judgment, it's going to be withdrawn in the judgment. And so in judgment, every last sin will be taken into consideration in fitting each sinner for the exact degree of punishment that he or she deserves. Now, it's the fool who says or reasons, well, you know, if I'm going to hell, I might as well, you know, have my fun uh, in the meantime. Well, every day given to sin, my friend, and, and follow this closely, every day given to sin, you know, you want to make yourself feel good. You want to have your, you know, have your cake and eat it too. You're going to have your fun in the meantime. Well, every venting lust, 
every untruthful word, every next sin committed only adds to the punishment that you will that will be assigned to you. It would be better for that man to die young than to live uh, only to uh, do what? Accumulate a lifetime of sin that will return to him in divine wrath. It makes no sense. It doesn't make any sense. But the extent to which a person by example and influence has led others to sin, that's the other person. The sec- this is the second consideration. In measuring judgment is the extent to which a person who by example and or influence, and this includes preachers as well, has led others to sin. And this is what our Lord affirmed in Matthew 8, 5 through 7. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around their neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Mark 9 uh, and verse number 38. But here James pronounces a woe to those who become uh, an occasion for others to sin. The degree to which a person influences others to sin will in turn serve in part to establish the degree uh, of his own of his own punishment. Now, this appears to be at least one reason why there must be a day of judgment at the end of time. Final judgment is not fixed upon the death of every individual sinner. It is not until the end of time that the full effect of of the influence of any one life, any one life can be measured. And now the omniscient God will take every individual and assess every aspect uh, of his or her influence. And sometimes an influence that extends for centuries. And to the basis of accumulated influences of evil, God will mete out the punishment upon the wicked. God's going to do that. God's going to do it. We can't do that. It wouldn't it wouldn't work for us if if we did that. But the thoughts of the the, the thought of this is stunning and deeply sobering. If if you if you, if if you're tracking this with me, watch this. Listen to this. That father and mother who refuse Christ and in turn influence their children away from the things of God will uh, the, all they're doing is increasing their guilt and the punishment they'll receive for it and their children as well. That older brother or sister or that friend or work associate who uh, stands above his or her peers and who uses their position of influence uh, to commit sin or influence sin and to ignore the gospel of Jesus Christ. All of that, all of that will be brought to bear in the day of judgment to measure the degrees of punishment those individuals, he or she or them, uh, will receive. Next, we have the extent to which the light and privilege are abused. The gospel light. Gospel light radio show. The third consideration is measuring judgment is the term or is the is, is to the extent to which light and privilege were abused. Jesus speaks directly to this in Luke chapter 12, verse 47. And he says, and that servant who knew his master's will but did not get ready or act according to his will, will receive a a severe beating. But the one who did not know and did what deserved a beating will receive a light beating. And everyone to whom much is given of him, much will be required. And from him to whom they entrust much, they will demand much more. Now, excuse me. The contrasting expression, severe beating and light beating, indicate contrasting degrees of punishment. Both of the men in view here were servants accountable to their master, but did things that were worthy of punishment. And both, in fact, received punishment, but one had more understanding that the other, uh, than the other, and as a consequence, received a greater punishment. Now, both received lashes, but for the one, it was many. For the other, it was a few. And at least we, and if, if you miss this point, our Lord interprets the parable for us. He says, everyone uh, to whom much was given, of him much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. That's to say, the extent of light and privilege abuse will be determined in part the measure of their judgment. 
Now, uh, Jesus also speaks to this consideration in other places in Scripture. Uh, in Matthew ten fifteen, Truly I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for their own. So as wicked and as guilty and as deserving of punishment as Sodom was, the greater sin belonged to Chorazin and Bethsaida. For they had seen and heard our Lord himself and had refused him. And for their abuse of such great light and privilege, their judgment is going to be more, a, a whole lot more. So, to, for me, as a, as a teacher, it's deeply disturbing that the person who grows up in a society in which the gospel is readily available and the person who grows up in a Christian home have great light and great privilege. The person who attends a gospel preaching church uh, or gospel church and, 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 and has uh, great light and privilege, uh, the person who has a Christian friend who witnesses to him and uh, about Christ, about Jesus and what it means to be saved, uh, has great light and privilege. And for this light and privilege, God will hold them accountable if such privilege is refused. Judgment will be unspeakably great for those who have heard the gospel only finally to refuse it. The gospel preached to them will in the end have served only to increase their guilt and enhance the punishment that they will receive. So what's the takeaway? What's the final thought on this? Well, I think the final thought about this is the punishment of hell will be in keeping with divine justice, as I said before. The all-knowing God will assess each individual life, counting exactly the amount of ab abandonment to sin, the influence of others to sin, and the light and privileged abuse. And he will assign punishment accordingly, exactly fitted for each person. So surely, this ought to capture your conscience especially uh, for those sinners, uh, that they would uh, restrain their sinning and accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. You know, even more so, this ought to drive any sinner to run to Christ and be saved. And surely, this thought might drive every believer, you and me, to humble yet glad praise for our Redeemer who took all of our sin to himself and pay the full price, absorbing the full wrath of God in our place in order to make us his. I hope this lesson was helpful and I hope you've learned something I, I'm, I'm, and I hope you uh, will uh, accept this and apply it to your life and help someone to be a part of, of Jesus Christ, to to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And as members of the body of Christ, if we are uh, sinning or causing others to sin, you know, we want to, you know, look at this and, and back up a little bit and take an inventory of ourselves and make sure that we will not fall into that area uh, uh, in hell. So I hope this lesson was helpful to you. Um, and I thank you for listening. Uh, may God bless you and keep your hand in God's hand, stay in God's grip. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. I know.
never, never, never lie. That's why I'm glad. I'm glad. I said I'm glad. I'm glad I know you, Lord. I'm so glad you know me, Lord. I'm glad you know me, Lord. We wanna give you the praise. listening to the gospel light radio show ladies and gentlemen that's our show i want to thank you for spending a little time with us this evening in a study of god's word i want to thank my co-host glenn mcmillian and dr frank washington jr for those fine lessons from the word of god i certainly appreciate their efforts each week on this broadcast ladies and gentlemen i don't take any of this for granted it's a lot of work putting these lessons together so i am just so encouraged that i have a team of uh gospel preachers here on this broadcast who are willing each week to proclaim the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Also want to thank my co-host Yusuf Ford for answering that shout out question. It was some anonymous queries, and I certainly appreciate the uh, people that are involved in that uh, shout out platform on social media, Facebook. Join that group, ladies and gentlemen, and get involved in those biblical discussions. Got some great discussions going on. What a blessing. It is my prayer that these lessons that this evening have been beneficial to your spiritual lives and your relationship with the Lord has been strengthened because you're not only tuning in this radio broadcast, but you've given yourself over to a study of God's word. So until we meet again, I pray God's continued blessings upon your lives and that he bless you real, real good. You've been listening to the Gospel Light radio show on behalf of my co host we really do appreciate your love and support for these programs. I'm your host, Steve R. Butler. Good night, everybody. God bless you. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Well, no, Jesus, hey, he will fix it. He'll fix it for you. Hey, I know that he knows what you want to do.
listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show.